Hello, everybody, and happy Wednesday. Welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle, the New York Football Giants. Lance Meadow, John Schmelk with you. The phone number is 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. We'll get to your calls early and often on today's show. Lance, I thought it would be a good idea. We haven't talked about this much to kind of go around the league and see where the kind of coaching searches have been heading and where they are. We'll do that quick. Uh, the Giants obviously still trying to find a defensive coordinator and special teams coordinator. The Giants have not been announcing any of those interviews. Um, but we can talk about a lot of teams. In addition to the head coaches, there's a lot of coordinator spots available to around the league. So we'll talk about that. And then since I am getting on a plane tomorrow morning, we'll do a little preview of the Senior Bowl and Shrine game as well. Uh, as we head into next week in college all-star season. Then we start getting into the uh, draft process as well. Lance, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. And it is a busy time in the National Football League, as you mentioned. Also, Joe Barry was let go by the Green Bay Packers, their defensive coordinator. We had been talking about that earlier in the week. So that's another team that did not have a head coaching change that is now going to be looking for a defensive coordinator. The Eagles are in the same boat as they part ways with Matt Patricia and Sean Desai. So yep. it's not just the eight teams that are searching for head coaches or have already. It's now a few more in addition to that. And Eagles in line for a new offensive coordinator yep. as well, according to Tom Pelissero. The Jaguars are looking for a defensive coordinator. Uh, assuming... Well, no, they filled it already. Oh, did they? Who, yeah, who the did Jaguars they hired Ryan Nielsen, former Falcons defensive That's right. They did bring him in. Yeah, You're so right. that one is done. Good call. Yeah. Raiders, it looks like they're going to retain Patrick Graham but they need to hire an offensive coordinator on that side. The Saints need an offensive coordinator. The Steelers need an offensive coordinator. And there's other teams as well that are looking for, obviously all these head coaches are going to need to fill out their coordinator staff as well when they eventually make their move. So a lot going on with that. We'll keep an eye on what the Giants are doing uh, with special teams and defensive coordinator as well. Obviously, uh, for a lot of these jobs, teams will be trying to hire people off of the four teams that remain still in the postseason. So they will have to wait and be a little bit more patient. But there are some decisions that have been made. The Titans hired Brian Callahan, who's the son of longtime offensive line coach Bill Callahan, uh, to be their offensive, uh, to be their head coach, rather. And he's going to call the plays there as well, which is ironic because he did not call the plays when he was in Cincinnati. So he's going to be taking on two two brand new jobs at the same time, which you wonder if that's a lot for one person to start doing both for the first time. We'll see. Uh, I'm curious to see how that's going to work. I mean, that may be his plan right now. He may change that depending on how the offseason plays yeah, out. Yeah, I wouldn't too. be surprised if you would want to try to. It's hard enough to be the head coach for yeah. the first year to be a first-time play caller on top of that. That's asking a lot. So we'll see how that goes for him. Uh, New England Patriots, Jared Mayo, obviously, it was written to his contract. He would be the successor to Bill Belichick, so he's the new head coach in New England. Uh, they're trying to fill out their staffs there as well up in New England. The Raiders, they re- retain Antonio Pierce, former Giant. Uh, again, it looks like Patrick Graham is going to stay there as defensive coordinator. Uh, they announced they're going to. There was a report that they're going to interview Mike Sullivan, former Giants quarterbacks coach and offensive coordinator as well uh, for their offensive coordinator position. But there are five spots, Lance, that are still remaining with open head coaching positions. You have the Panthers. It's been long rumored that Ben Johnson is the favorite for that spot. The Lions offensive coordinator, but they've done a lot of interviews as well. Well, Dave Canales just got his second interview. Yep. The Bucks offensive coordinator. Who did a really nice job with, with Baker Mayfield this yep. year. Then you have the Falcons, who they've done a couple interviews with Bill Belichick. I believe they've done Jim Harbaugh twice as well. Yep. Uh, so they've had a bunch of interviews there. That's the only job that Belichick has been connected to over the course of this process, which is interesting. The Harbaugh report was that I believe they're within striking distance. Is is, is that for what the, the report was yeah. for the for the Los Angeles Chargers? Then you have the Washington Commanders and the Seattle Seahawks, where they've done a bunch of interviews, uh, but there hasn't been anyone really specifically linked with those specific jobs. Well, and with the Commanders, you have the general manager in place and Adam Peters, yep. who they brought over from the Niners. The Raiders just hired Tom Telesco, former Chargers general manager, because there's a number of these teams that also were looking for head coaches and general And the managers. Panthers um, promoted Dan, Dan Morgan, Morgan from correct. within to be their GM. Yeah, mm-hmm. so as soon as some of these teams solidify their general manager spots, you figure that makes it a little bit easier for them to then make a hire for a head In coach. Fact, but Lance, how many GM spots? The Falcons have their GM. They retain theirs, right? The Chargers yep. still have to hire their GM because that would be probably correct. Be they got rid of to Telesco. Harbaugh. Yep. Washington has their GM. Seattle, obviously, John Schneider still there, yep. so he's still their GM. So I think and that might be the only spot that needs a GM left. No. Yeah, but I'm just Is saying the there's Chargers? been a fury of uh, several yes, teams correct. that have recently. But I think the Chargers are the only Myers. team left without a GM. No. Yeah, of those eight teams that you have on the list, well, unless the, the Patriots, Patriots decide to hire a general manager. The Patriots. Good yeah. point. Yeah. So, so I guess those would be the two, right? Yeah, because Bob, Bob Kraft did not make it 
certain that that was going to be the plan, given the fact that Belichick held both roles. They may just have somebody be a pseudo general manager who's already in the front office, or they could very well bring in somebody. They need a personnel guy to run personnel. That's what they need. Whoever whether he's titled, yeah, he may not GM have that title. Not, Correct. But who yeah. cares? They need. You can't ask Jared Mayo to be the general. No, manager but they could very well have somebody internal that sure. just takes on that role. I don't Absolutely. think that's crazy at all. Plus, I mean, remember Mayo's been within the organization as a player and as an assistant, so he knows all the personnel people. Correct. If they promote somebody or give the title to somebody, that's not that big of an adjustment. The bigger surprise was more of, I think, what the Raiders did because Telesco and Pierce don't have any history together, and that's unusual. You know, normally you'd have the general manager in place first, and then they'd finalize the head coach. Here they promoted Antonio Pierce, then they brought in Tom Telesco. I thought that was a little bit interesting. Yeah, and I get bringing in a GM that has experience because you want to pair him with a head coach that hasn't done the job before. But Tom Telesco also, you know, he had two really good quarterbacks in L.A. with Philip oh, Rivers yeah. and now Justin Herbert. Never exactly put together a championship caliber team. No, either. but had a really good draft class year in and year out, though. If you go back and you look at the history of the talent he brought in, Chargers were not lacking talent. The Chargers were lacking health, durability, and efficiency on special teams. That was the Chargers' biggest issue. I mean, he brought in Keenan Allen. He brought in Justin Herbert. He brought in Rashawn Slater. He brought in several guys on defense, including Derwin James. I mean, there's at least one player per year that turned out to be a big part of that core True. for Telesco. I, I will say this, though. Quentin Johnston, not a great rookie. Well, that was the most recent class. I'm I'm just just going through the classes. Zion Johnson has not played particularly well as a first-round guard. You're right, Rashawn Slater the year before is very good. Justin Herbert. Then Kenneth Murray as a first-round pick. He got benched by them. That did not work out. Jerry Tillery, that did not work out. Nasir Adderley, their second-round pick, did not work out. So there are are a number of classes where the first-round pick did not hit either. Yeah, but I, I think overall, I would argue if you look at his entire drafting process, I think it's pretty impressive. Sure. And I could see why the Raiders went after him because well, they feel Bosa, that he's going to get talent. Williams, Derwin yeah, James. I mean, he's had playmakers year in and year White out. Even. Yeah, yeah, a lot of good talent that came in. Even the cornerback that they drafted, Asante Samuel Jr., yeah, no, he's been good. too, is another yeah. guy mm-hmm. that he brought in. So, I mean, I, I like the hire. I just thought it was unusual, the timing and who they're matching up. I thought other teams would actually make a push for Telesco. And I was also thinking, remember, Telesco came from the Patriots organization. If Belichick wound up going somewhere, I thought maybe Telesco Telesco as a general I manager Telesco came would make Patriots. sense because there's a bit of a history, but that wouldn't make sense in Atlanta because, A, you already have Rich McKay there, who's a highly respected front office executive, and Terry Fontenot, who is not technically the head chief there because McKay's the CEO. The way the Falcons have it set up is the general manager and the head coach have equal power and both report to McKay. So... New England is very different setup-wise than what Atlanta presents, but Belichick at least has some good guys to lean on in the event he decides yeah. to take that job. And now here are the main, and this is, I think, what's interesting, Lance, and add names that you think I'm forgetting here. The main candidates for head coaching positions, based on what we've seen, right, and guys that have gotten multiple interviews in places, all right? You have Dan Quinn, Dallas Cowboys defensive coordinator, Bill Belichick, obviously, Jim Harbaugh, obviously, Mike Vrabel, who is not, I feel like, had a ton of interviews yeah, he over is the not. course yeah. of this process, which is surprising to me. Uh, ben Johnson, the Lions offensive coordinator. Mike McDonald, the Ravens defensive coordinator. Uh, Bobby Slowick, the offensive Texans. coordinator for the Texans. Uh, Dave Canales, to your point, the offensive coordinator for the Bucks, And then Mike Kafka, the offensive coordinator for the Giants. A couple of uh, the Ravens defensive assistants have been interviewed for defensive coordinator jobs or reported to be. Uh, any other main guys you would put on that list? in terms of head coach candidates that I missed? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't really think off the top of my head anybody that we missed of that group. I'm just I'm perusing NFL teams to see if there's another coordinator that maybe hasn't received interest but should. I would throw out, I think that there's a few guys that are intriguing in terms of coordinator positions. For example, Eric Bieniemy has not received a lot of interest. Remember, he was a hot commodity in years past. I do think, I know Bieniemy interviewed for the Washington job. But, you know, there's no guarantee with a new general manager and Anna Peters that they want to promote somebody from internally. But I will say this. Whoever needs an offensive coordinator position should go after Eric Biennemi. And if I'm actually Nick Sirianni, I'd go after Eric Biennemi if he doesn't get the Washington Commander's job. Because, A, he knows the division. He's worked with 
a wide array of talent. He's a former NFL player, and they need, the Eagles need an established individual to call plays after what they went through with Brian Johnson, the QB coach, who did not have previous play calling duties. So that's the one name that we didn't mention. I'd keep Eric Bieniemy in the mix. I know Cliff Kingsbury has already interviewed also. Those were some places for OCs. OCs. Well, that's another name, but former Mm -hmm. head coach who has plenty of experience. I mean, that's who I think Philadelphia should target. Raheem Morse is another one from the Rams, the Rams defensive coordinator. Aaron Glenn, the Lions Lions defensive coordinator, or someone that has been interviewed for job. Anthony Weaver, that was one of the Ravens defensive coaches that I talked about. I can see Josh McDaniels going back to an OC somewhere. Well, if Belichick gets the job, I can see him teaming up with him. The other guy that probably should— Todd Monken, right? Todd Monken, yeah, the Ravens offensive coordinator. And he actually went for a few head coaching interviews, I believe, before they had the previous round. And he's a hot commodity because of what he did for the Ravens. David Shaw had a couple interviews with people. Former Stanford coach. Yeah, um, going through some of these other names here. Todd Monken had a couple Mm -hmm. of coaching interviews as well. Um, the Seahawks offensive coordinator just took that job. Took with the Bears. In the Bears, yeah. which I think is a really good Shane fit. Waldron. Yep. yep, Shane Waldron, who did a nice job with Geno Smith there. I'm surprised. Yep. Well, you know, new head coach. You don't want to force anybody on him. I totally understand that. But that basically, I think, adds it up. So I think the, the, the question here, Lance, is who's going to be left without a dance partner? Because you only have six spots, rema- five spots remaining here. Dan Quinn, Belichick, Harbaugh, Ben Johnson, Vrabel, Mike McDonald. Those are the guys in Raheem Morris. Those are the guys that I would consider like the guys that are ready, yeah. right? You know, Bobby Sloan's got a lot of interviews. He's only been calling plays for a year. I think that's a little fast for him, right? See, even for like Dave Canales, he's kind of like new on the scene, right? That, I think that will be a big jump for him and, you know, to, to get a head coaching job right away. Mike Kafka could be in that list as well. So you're looking at, you know, seven or eight candidates there that are very qualified. I think some, a lot of people wouldn't be surprised if they were a head coach this year. Who do you think is most likely to land a gig and most likely to be left with that one when this hiring cycle is over? I could see Vrabel sitting out a year and sort of hitting the reset button. I don't think that's crazy. I don't see him. He's also young enough to do it. Taking a defensive coordinator job. He also may go the collegiate route, maybe serve as a consultant for a year and then jump back into the NFL. I don't see Vrabel going DC. I think think he would just take the year off before he would be a DC. Well, or once again, I mean, you've seen a lot of these roles in college where guys, they don't even go to the campus from home remotely. They serve as consultants. Consultants. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. I could see him do that. And remember, Bill O'Brien just went to Ohio State. Yep. Vrabel's a former Ohio State guy so I could see him perhaps serving as a consultant in some capacity I think Ben Johnson and I is think likely can be picky too like he doesn't have to take well, a that's job more of a he reason. doesn't like yeah. correct and that's why I think if you sit out like Sean Payton did yeah. and then you just wait to see what's attractive for you the following year who knows I mean Belichick may do that too it's hard to imagine him being without football for a year but if the Atlanta Falcons doesn't enamor him at his he age could also sit out his age it's tough though he wants to break the record. He's 71 years old. Sitting out a year at this age, I think, would be a, a would be a tough pill for him to swallow. Well, no, I agree. If Shula's record is his ultimate goal, which I'm sure it is, I think this gives you at least an opportunity to get halfway home because he needs 15 to break the record. You could win eight games with Atlanta this past season. Sure. Next season, I, mean, I should say. They won seven last year. Yeah. Right? Well, plus the division is not overwhelming. There's no juggernaut there. He could easily win the division and get to the playoffs. They've got pieces there, and I could see them making a move for a quarterback. So, yeah, if that's... That's his priority, but if he doesn't love how things are presented and he says to himself, Mike McCarthy has an expiring contract, want to wait to see if Jerry after next season, Bill could do that too. It's not crazy. I mean, he can wait around and see whether or not that happens. I know there was a lot of rumors, and that's why it's kind of interesting. Sean Payton went to Denver. If he would have waited another year, maybe he could have got the Chargers job and worked with Justin Herbert right now. Or the Dallas job. Because if Sean Payton's sitting there, maybe he doesn't stick with Mike McCarthy, Jerry Jones. Yeah, but the difference is you'd have to make a trade for Sean under those circumstances. One there, I think there was another year remaining. I'm not sure if there on was the a, deal. I, I know there was last up. year. I'm not sure there was. Were there yeah. two years left though? I I could be mistaken. Maybe there was only a you year. You might be right. I'm not sure. But to be honest, the bottom you. line is a little bit different mm-hmm. in terms of going after Belichick versus going after Sean Payton. But I think I'd be surprised if Ben Johnson doesn't get a job, the Lions' offensive coordinator. He was a big name last season, so I'd I'd be surprised if he lasts an entire cycle again. But Vrabel's the guy I could see taking a year off. I yeah. think of all the people we mentioned. I agree with you. And it looks like Belichick, the only place he's interviewed with is 
Atlanta. So yeah. it's either there or nothing for him. And they are also hot and heavy on Harbaugh. So if Harbaugh goes to the Chargers, I would not be surprised if shortly thereafter, then you see Belichick very possible. go to Atlanta. All right, so let's move on very quickly. Uh, college All-Star game is coming up. Practices start over the weekend down in Frisco for the Shrine Bowl. I'll be down there. And then we head to Mobile for practices next week. And then the Shrine Bowl, is the game is late next week. And then the Senior Bowl is not this Saturday, the following Saturday. So make sure you go check those out. But I'll be out there. I'll be trying to you know call in here and do reports on, on Big Blue Kickoff throughout the week. And just a couple of things I want to note going in. And go check out draft season. It just got posted. Tony Pauline and I do a full breakdown. Of, of all these guys and all these positions. So make sure you go check that out. But a couple of things to note. When you go to watch these practices, Lance, same thing when you're here watching NFL practices. You want to watch the one-on-ones, right? And the sets of wide receivers and defensive backs and defensive linemen, and especially the offensive line class, which is the best individual position group I've ever seen at the Senior Bowl. It's that loaded. They're going to be a lot of fun. I mean, these all these offensive linemen, Lance, could be first-round picks, all right? Talisi Fuaga, the offensive tackle from Oregon State. Tyler Guyton, the offensive tackle from Oklahoma. Graham Barton, the tackle from Duke, who's probably going to go to guard. He has a chance to sneak into the back end of the first round. Um, Jordan Morgan, the tackle out of Arizona. Kingsley Suamatai out of Brigham Young. Troy Fatanu out of Washington. And then even Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon, who's a center. Those are all guys just on the offensive line, that could be first-round picks. You're looking at six or seven guys just in one position group at this offensive line that could go in the first round. Then you have a bunch of second-round guys. Cooper Beebe, a guard. Uh, Zach Frazier is a day-two guy, West Virginia. Dominic Puni out of Kansas could be a day-two guy. Those are all interior offensive linemen. So, Giant fans, go pay attention. You could have your second-round and third-round offensive linemen sitting there going down in Mobile. Now, Joe Alton, Olu Fashanu, who are the two pre- presumptive top offensive linemen that are going to get picked, they're not there. That's fine. you got a bunch of other guys that are going to be really, really good football players. So that's a group to watch. And then, you know, defensive back, Lance, as you well know, very rarely do guys go four years at cornerback and then come out. you got a lot of, you know, tr- Richard sophomores, true juniors, yep. stuff like that. And now the Senior Bowl has opened it up a little bit this year. You don't have to be a senior anymore. But this is one of the best groups of defensive backs. Both Penn State defensive backs are very good. Johnny Dixon and Kalen King, they're excellent. Um, local flavor, Max Melton out of Rutgers, who's a nice player. He'll be there. Uh, Ennis Rackestraw out of Missouri. He could be a first-round pick. Uh, Quinia Mitchell out of Toledo. He's going to be a first-round pick. So you have a lot of really good defensive backs. And then Lad McConkey out of Georgia is a really good receiver. He's going to be there. Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina, is 6'5", and he's going to run sub 4'4'5". Four, four, he's that fast. So that's a guy that's going to be there. And then the guy that Drake May was throwing to all year, Devontas Walker, is going to be there. Roman Wilson, who just won a national championship. So just a lot of good one-on-one opportunities. A couple first-round defensive tackles from Texas and, and Murphy and, and Devontae Sweat. So this is a this is as good of a senior bowl roster. I didn't even mention the quarterbacks, Michael Penix and Bo Nix. This is as good of a senior bowl roster, Lance, as I've ever seen. You're going to have a bunch of first round picks, and then day two is going to be loaded up with these senior bowl players. That's going to be a lot of fun. Well, and we see this every season. There's always a few guys that emerge, and it's not because of what they do in the game. It's because of what they do in practice yep. every week. I mean, I'll give you an example. Jaden Reed, who went to the Packers last year, he had a really good senior bowl week. Sidney Brown, who went to the Eagles in round three, and he had example, a good senior bowl week. Great point on Jaden Reed, because that year Michigan State's offense was a disaster. So his production wasn't great. Yep. It had nothing to do with him. They just were a disaster offensively, but then he showed at the senior bowl what he could do. Sure, and that's why these one-on-ones are critical even for members of the scouting department and the coaching staff because you also see good against good. The caliber of the competition that these players are going against is very high. It's not as if they're throwing them in against third and fourth stringers from maybe some of the powerhouse teams. So I think you get a better gauge on a daily basis considering the reps are consistent what this player could do. And also, I mean, if you're going to draft a wide receiver you want to see separation within practice. You're going to draft a cornerback and you're playing a man-to-man defensive set. You want to see that he could stick with his guy. It's no different when you see the battle in the trenches. If the offensive lineman can't hold up on containing the edge rushers, then maybe that's a red flag regardless of how good of offense he was a part of. Or if he wasn't necessarily a splash player on defense because what they asked him to do within the scheme was not get after the quarterback, but then you see the one-on-ones and he's doing damage 
maybe that's more appealing that he could fit right into your schematic. So that's why the practices for the Senior Bowl are so critical. And I think if you ask any members of the coaching staff in the scouting departments, they'll tell you the same thing. I mean, the game is nice, but I don't really think it holds much weight in comparison to what you see in the days prior. No, most of the people are out of there on Thursday yeah. night. No, but I mean, some do hang around. For example, yeah, Gettle, Gettleman hung around mm-hmm. to watch Daniel Jones, if memory serves me correctly, in the actual game. Not that, once again, I think that made the difference, but he did want to see him in a game setting, but most are focused in, obviously, on the day-to-day operation and practice. Yeah, and seeing the guys operate practice, the intensity yeah. they practice at, all that sort of stuff is really fun to see. All right, guys, go check out our other podcast. You have the Giants Huddle Podcast. That's brought to you by Citizens. Interviews with analysts and Giants, players, coaches, former Giants, former coaches, you name it. Um, Arjun Menon's up there right now, a PFF analyst. We kind of do a primer on what the Giants' offseason resources are and how it ranks in the league. Uh, he has them ranked number five, fifth most in terms of draft capital and in terms of cap space and the ability to restructure contracts as well. We talk about all that stuff on the Giants on a podcast. Go check it out. Giants.com slash podcast, your favorite podcast platform, the Giants app. And check out our other podcast, which is now rip-roaring, ready to go. That's draft season. Tony, Pauline, and I do everything NFL draft. Our last episode just went up now. Uh, check it out if you're listening live when the show is done. We do a full-out preview of the uh, Senior Bowl and Shrine Game and the players in both those games. That's brought to you by Visa. So make sure you go check that out. All right, 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513. Let's go to Mikey in L.A. He'll lead us off. Hey, Mikey. Hey, what's going on, fellas? How you doing? What's going on? Yeah, first-time caller, bro. Well, thanks for calling in, man. What do um, you got? Yeah, for sure. I had a, a, a draft day question. Sure. Um, so, yeah, my thoughts. Let's say, um, hypothetically, the Bears stay and they end up taking Caleb or Drake or whoever to be the new franchise guy and they don't know what to do with Fields. Is there a world where the Giants could trade the Seattle second for Fields exercising his fifth-year option to keep him under a rookie contract while we're still under contract with DJ and let them duke it out or – kind of see where he takes the team while DJ still coming up in recovery. From a from a mechanical perspective, is that possible? Yes. Whoever acquires Justin Fields yeah. in a trade. Now, the question mm-hmm. is when that trade would happen, right? Because yeah. the, the fifth year deadline, I believe, is before it's usually in the draft spring. day. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that would have to, you would have to complete that. And look, if the Bears are gonna do that, they're gonna move Fields sooner rather than early. later, I would think. So, yes, in theory, whoever then trades for Fields, as long as it's prior to that fifth-year deadline and Lance is going to check out exactly yeah. when it is, they could mm-hmm. do that, yes. But then it does get tricky, right? Because even that fifth-year option, you're still looking. I think the fifth-year option is, is, is 20-something million dollars at this point. And Lance, check mm-hmm. that out, too, what, uh, what, uh, what the quarterback number is. But it's not small. It is fairly right. large. So then you're still managing those two cap hits at the same time. So is it possible? Yes. But then you're going to have to make a decision on paying fields shortly thereafter, after that fifth-year option is up. So it does add another complication from a financial team-building perspective. But in terms of mechanics, is that a possibility? Yes. I see $23 million for the fifth-year option for quarterback. $23 million, thank you. And I think it's right after the draft, because last year was May 2nd was the deadline. So it literally is like a day or two after the draft. All right, good call, Lance. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that could be a that could be a day of thing. And, yes. and next year is still his fourth year, right? So what's his cap for the fourth year? Uh I, I mean as DJ a first round pick, is... his fourth year cap it is probably somewhere around six or seven million dollars, we might bet. But I yeah. yeah. Okay. But I can check that. Okay. Yeah, that could that, that could work out. Because we know that Joe, you know, based on the last two years of draft, he's not someone who's gonna reach if the first three quarterbacks are gone, he's not going to pull another or you know he'd, he'd either trade up or trade back for him yeah his, his, um, his cap hit next year would be six million in 2024 okay yeah so i mean i know that next year would be daniel's second year which is you know where the the, the guarantee is is done right uh the guarantee is not completely done but there is a window to get out with not a ridiculous amount of dead money after the second right okay yeah. so yeah so if we did t- if we did take field next year on his six million while daniel still has his big cap that's like a that's probably the time to do it, just to kind of see where where field can 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 take us if, if anywhere. But, yeah, that would that would that, yeah, that, that, that would be like a fifty million combined cap number with both quarterbacks together, which is high. Oh yeah. Yeah, it is, but it's probably still not the highest. <laughs> believe you know, believe it or not, 
the way these contracts are structured, that would probably be in terms of if you count that as one player, that would probably be the third or fourth highest number yeah, next year in for the sure, league. For sure. mm-hmm. Okay. All right. All right, yeah, that was my only question for today, guys. Well, I appreciate you taking my No, nah, Mikey, good question. Appreciate the call. And he said the Seattle pick. I think someone would offer more than that for Justin Fields. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you're talking about a player with starting experience who's still young and has not reached his potential. I think, I think at, it's going to take more than that. At worst, they're getting yeah. a high second-round pick. And I think, yeah. you know, I'm, I've mentioned the Steelers before. I think that's a team that has a late first-round pick that would consider something like that. I'll look at the draft. I also, I, I also think if the Giants make a trade like that, that means that they do not feel very good about Daniel Jones. That would be my you're interpretation. Right, because if you trade for Justin Fields, right? You're basically. I mean, what, what do you, you get? Bench, bench, yeah. bench Justin Fields. Then, like, to me, a, a to team me. that trades for Justin Fields says Fields is coming in. He's going to be our starter day one. I don't think the Giants right now are in that position. Right. So I'd be very surprised if they make a move for that. Like, I'd be shocked if the Falcons didn't offer their second round Yeah, pick, but that team example. makes sense because right. right away you move in Justin Fields. He's your right. starter. Well, I'm making the point yeah. of why the Seattle second round pick wouldn't be enough. Right. Sure. Because yeah. a team like the, the Falcons at the top of the second round would probably make that offer. I could see a team like the Vikings who are trying to figure out their future at the position. If they say, you know what, maybe we don't want Kirk Cousins back. We prefer a younger guy in there. I could see that being a team that would maybe make a move and offer an early second round pick. How about the Broncos? Sean yeah, Payton's never shy about being aggressive going for players, right? They have the 12th pick in the first round. That's another team. Well, the Raiders, too. How about the Raiders? Yeah. You took the yeah. words right out of my yeah. mouth. Another team that's going to be looking for a quarterback. So there are a lot of teams there that would have a better pick than the Giants' Seattle-owned second or from Seattle second-round pick. So I think, again, I don't think that's a really good fit. I don't think that's going to happen, and we're not speculating on somebody on another team. We're just answering your question here. But... To me, that that does not, I don't know, between the the money factor and then Jones coming back, they're both expected to start next year. It it just doesn't make, it makes more sense to me to spend a higher pick on a younger guy that if he sits for a little while, that's okay. Like Justin Fields doesn't need to sit. Yeah. The guy started in the league for three years. So. Well, and also it would be a lower cap hit, too, depending Correct. on who you draft and where you draft. That's why I think Fields is going to go to a team that realistically doesn't see a pathway to get high in the draft to take the guy they want. Bingo. And then that's a good way. I don't want to say it's settling, but it's a, still a very attractive option because you're going to have to give up draft capital anyway to get Justin Fields, but you have a more proven commodity that comes in that could actually start for your team immediately. 201-939-4513. Good question, though, Mikey. Excellent. Let's go to uh, Cliff in New York. He's up next. Hi, Cliff. Hey, guys. Great to hear your stuff today, as usual. Um, the, when I, I, I told Pearson I want to talk about trading down, but before I, before I get to that, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that all that talk about the coaches that you did uh, opens up some opportunities for, for Dable to, to hire people. Uh, that are that are better than the options that he has now because he doesn't know what his options are yet. And um, well, I, I don't I don't see it. how I don't see how those would that would if anything it would reduce options right because these head coaches then would hire their own coordinators and that would take people off the board that the Giants could hire. Oh, no? Well, if it, oh well, they would they would make a lateral move to be a DC or a, or a, an OC. Who would make well, a who would who would you talk about a head coach that lost his job? Um. A guy that didn't get the head coaching opportunity, you were running through that list. Oh, no, no, no. Would, yeah. no those, those, those guys aren't leaving their current jobs for a lateral move. Like, Raheem Morris is not leaving his current job. Bobby Slowick's not leaving his current job. Mike McDonald's not leaving his current job. Yeah, they're job. currently employed. Yeah, those guys aren't going I, I mean, the only guy that you're looking at is a Mike Vrabel, for example, but I find it hard yes. to believe that he's going to settle for a defensive coordinator job. Okay. He's probably best just sitting out for a season or, once again, going the college route. As far as the other head coaches that lost their jobs, I mean, Ron Rivera. I know Rivera has come out and says he wants to get back into coaching. Maybe Rivera is the exception. What I could see Rivera. He interviewed with his interview with Philly, right, for their D.C. job? Well, is which that makes what I sense read? for Sirianni. Right. So, I mean, it's possible. But then again, I mean, we haven't heard any rumors about the Giants bringing him in for an interview. But Rivera is the type of guy I could see him taking a D.C. job who was a previous head coach and maybe moving laterally, as you pointed out. I don't think a lot of the other guys, though, Cliff, are going to make such a move. Okay. Well, Rivera would appeal to me, that's for sure. Well, and Um, that's why I said uh, that that, that would be one guy that I think perhaps would make sense under the circumstances. Sounds like we lost Cliff uh, there. We got him still. At least I'm hearing him. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, the, the perspective I'm feeling overall is, is very similar to when Joe Shane first got here, when I was saying, oh boy, I want to really see what this guy can do with a lot of draft capital. And going into the third uh, season for him, I'm feeling exa- pretty much the same way. Because, you know, it's easy to forget. Nobody wants to hear about long-term projects. But when Gettleman took over, the, the, the situation was n- the, the recent draft picks not only weren't re-signing with the Giants, but they weren't having jobs anywhere else in the league. That was the, that was the low point that, that Gettleman started with. Well, no, and yeah, right, right, right. That, that was before Dave came on that that was happening. Right. Correct. Right. And that was, that was what we were told. He was brought on to, you know, to fix or to, to start fixing anyway. And, and um, he had to be let go. We all understood. Phil Sims was the one that helped me understand why he had to be let go just by the way when he was asked to, during the uh, uh, Jake not from the insurance company debacle, he said, well, do you think the Giants have to make a change? Uh, and, and Phil said, oh, they have to. You know, the way he said it, you know. It was like the people knew that some progress had been made, but the, but the train wreck was so severe. So anyway, in comes Joe Shane, and, and, um, and, I'm, and I'm very pumped, and, um, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to get a handle on, on, and I hear from you, John, that you don't think this is a one-year project for Joe, or two years, and and you said three years for what? No, no, no. Len, Len, Len said three years, not me. Len said three years yesterday. No, no. I'm, I mean, not yesterday. I mean, all, all along you were telling uh, how much of a what the length of the project was for oh, Joe Shane. Oh, 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 you mean when he arrived? Yes, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I turned it. I turned it at, at least a three-year deal for sure. Right. So what I'm hoping for is that this year is maybe a turning point in the roster because it looks like. You know, you can't, you can't, there, there were some impact players, and I wanted to ask Lance about the, the definition of the impact players from the draft, which are not first-round picks. That, that, that starts in round three, Lance? Well, I mean, it depends on who you're going after. I mean, you can find impactful guys in second and third round. I mean, that's not a stretch. That's not asking for much. I think you go further back, it's more of a pleasant surprise than an expectation. But you could find guys in the second and third round. I mean, look at the Lions, for example. Look at their draft class this year. I mean, they have a lot of depth that they brought in, and all of those guys got out on the field and contributed. Remember, it's twofold. Right. It's not about where you draft the player. It's also how much of an opportunity are you giving that player immediately in year one. And I think we've seen that with respect to the Giants. But, for example, yeah. a guy like Dane Belton, Okay, Dane Belton had a really nice finish to the season earlier in the year he didn't play. So if you're going to draft a guy, the next question is, are you putting him on the field? Or are you having him watch, learn, and observe? It's a two-fold question there. That's what it comes down to. You could draft a guy in the fourth round or the third round. You don't play him. It really doesn't mean much of anything at the end of the day. Well, if you're developing him, if, you, if you're smart, the, the, I got pumped for Joe Shane being a judge of talent, you know, and, and with his scouting background and everything, and he had some experience with developing players or at least watching it in, in various stops in his career, and I'm hoping that he really knows how to do that. So I'm, 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 I don't, for impact player for me from second through, I mean, I consider Slayton in a five uh, has had some level of an impact. Sure. I mean, uh uh, uh, th- th- these guys uh, don't have to uh, impact immediately for me to, to be an impact player, you know. Well, but if I you want to, but but Cliff, if you want to make the jump that you're talking about, yeah, thank you, Cliff. Appreciate the call. I, I don't think then you can wait three or four years down the line for them to make that level of an impact. I think the whole point is you draft them within two years, you see something out of them. I mean, for example, Wondell Robinson, who was a second round pick in 2022, unfortunately he got hurt towards ACL his rookie year. But this year, at least the second half of the season, I think we saw an impact out of him, and he's a guy to watch. Hopefully he can stay on the field for a full year in 2024. But no one says draft a guy in the third round and then wait two to three years later to actually see him start to scratch the surface. I think you want a far more immediate impact than that, especially if you're the Giants and where you are positioned with respect to the rest of the NFL landscape. Hey, Giant fans, take your fandom to the next level with a Giant season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2024 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. Scott, New Mexico is up next. Then Leroy and Charleston's up after that. Scott, what's going on? Hey, guys, how are you doing today? What's up, Scott? All right. 
Uh, I was kind of depressed after listening to yesterday's broadcast. Uh, Len said we have a mess so far as the lineup, and Hugo said Saquon Barkley wasn't worth the money we were going to pay him. I respect both of those guys, but I, I don't think the team's that big a mess. And I don't know who you're going to replace Saquon Barkley with. Uh, before I get to my main points, I wanted to ask you both a question yes. about Mike Kafka. Do you think he'll return to the Giants? I know you all have a crystal ball, but uh, based on all the openings there are, do you think Mike Kafka will be coming back? Well, I mean, if I had to guess right now, do what I yeah. think? Do I think he's going to get one of the head coaching jobs? As we talked about, there's a lot of really guys that with a lot of experience that are highly qualified. I think it's it's going to be tough to be to, to get one of the five jobs left. I hope for Mike's sake that he does. I think he's a great coach. I think he's wonderful. But I think you prepare for the fact and the expectation would not the expectation, but I think you prepare as though he's not going to get one of those jobs. You also prepare for the contingency that he is. And if he doesn't get one of those jobs, I know there's been, you know, whispers and rumors out there. You know, I don't know anything that any of that's true. I would assume that if he doesn't get one of those head coaching jobs, that he's going to be back. Well, time is of the essence too, Scott. You have to look at it from this standpoint. The more time that elapses, the more positions get filled and then you don't have as many choices. And here's the other thing. If Kafka wants to leave and it's not a head coaching position, the Giants need Mm -hmm. to give him permission to do that, remember. Okay? Because he's still under contract with the team. He's not a free agent where he just gets up and goes wherever he wants. So there are limitations and restrictions, even if you want to go down that road. And, you know, normally I would think if coordinators part ways with teams, given the fact that we're already at the tail end of January, early February, those decisions normally are made by now. That's just my personal opinion based on track record. Could crazier things okay. happen? Sure. But I think it, where we are on the calendar right now, I'd be very surprised. Okay. Let me get to my main points. Uh, I always think that when you build an offensive line, I know you always start with the left tackle, but I always think that the interior of the offensive line really is important. And the reason being is pass rushers now are trying to go up the middle to limit what the quarterback can do, and that usually will run into the pass rushers on the outside. No, Scott, you're so right. Think... A lack of interior protection actually hurts you more than a lack of exterior protection, right. but guards are easier to find than tackles. That would be the difference okay. in that conversation. Well, you mentioned a guy I'm really high on, Cooper BB out of uh, Kansas State. He's 3364, and if you read his bio and, and what they've talked about him, He's the kind of guy that once he locks on to a uh, defensive player, he doesn't let go. He's a mauler. He, he's a mauler. Uh, and I'd like to see him hopefully in the second round. Uh, if he's available, that the Giants take him. Because I think the best way to approach the offensive line is through the draft. The only player in free agency I'm looking for the Giants to take, and uh, hopefully they can mortgage the team if they have to, but that's Bryce Huff of the Jets. And if they can get him... Uh, they would have a diamond in the rough. That's the guy that I'd be looking for for the Giants to take. Well, the problem, the Scott, is that I'm not sure how much in the rough he's going to be based on how teams like to give out money to, to the yeah. edge rushers right. in free agency. <laughs> no, I, I'm I, honestly, I'm curious what the price tag is going to be for him because if you look at the non-sack pass rush metrics like win rate and pressure rate and stuff like that, he's near the top of the league. So right. I, I wonder how teams are going to view him given some of the underlying metrics versus the actual sack production, which is good, but not off the charts. Uh, I'm curious to see what his price tag is going to be. Like, would it shock me if he got upwards of 18 or $20 million? It would not. Okay. so uh, It also I'm depends on believer. the Jets and their level of interest yes. in bringing it back, too. I'm sure when a guy gets 10 sacks, that doesn't necessarily just get hidden and overshadowed in terms of how they evaluate their own guys. Now, they also drafted Will McDonald in the first round last year, so my guess is that that's kind of like you're bringing the young guy to replace the veteran, but who knows? You're right. I mean, he was so good last year, they might want to bring him back. And they pride themselves on depth and having multiple options, too, up front, so they can rotate. You didn't sound like you wanted to come back to the Jets unless there was money involved. Well, uh, money changes that, though. You may not want to come back, and then a team shows you the dollar bill signs, (laughs) and all of a sudden, you're more than happy coming back. So, I I, I wait to see how the process plays out before I put much right. stock in that. Okay. The, the question, and then I'm going to take it off the air. Uh, I look at teams like Green Bay, who almost beat San Francisco, and how important are the first and second and third round drafts? If you look at their, and, I, and this Usually. relates to, to their, uh, to the wide receivers we have, for example, Slayton, Hodgins, uh, Wondell Robinson. Uh, if you look at Green Bay's uh, wide receivers on the Matt LaFleur this year, yeah, they're Romeo all young. Dobbs, 
Robio Dobbs drafted the fourth round. Botavian Wicks, fifth round. The two tight ends, Kraft and Musgrave, third and second round, respectively. So it can be done. Now, Jaden Reed was just the dud. Don't leave out Jaden Reed just because you don't like when he was drafted. He was a second round pick, and Christian Watson was a second round pick. Christian Watson was a second round draft. So so, so just to add that up, in that wide receiver room, you have three second round picks, two wide receivers and a tight end, and two third round picks, and a fourth round pick. So that is a lot of draft capital put into those two rooms. But, but I, they're, I, all, they're all effective is, is really the, the key. And what I'm worrying about is talent evaluation, how we do it. My biggest thing, uh, John Michael Schmitz was my original uh, question to, uh, uh, to Pearson. I was wondering when I was looking at, for example, Tyler Lindebaum, who I, I know you guys weren't that enthusiastic about. He's now an all-pro center. He's not allowed a sack. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, we would like Tyler Lindebaum. We didn't like him as a top-10 pick, all right, because he was a center. Right. But picking him in the mid to end of the first round was an excellent pick, and I praised the okay. Ravens profusely for that selection, but you don't pick centers in the top-10. Right. So, so what I'm wondering is, uh, with the giant line, uh, John Michael Schmitz, I think, has a lot of talent, but he allowed five sacks, was the fifth most in the NFL, and 30 pressures. I think he'll grow and get better. But the two guards that they need to get, I think they need to get through the draft and not through free agents. Why is that? Why? Why? why do you say that? Because uh, to me, the guy, the, the Scott, is just real quick, because my theory in free agency is that mm-hmm. you target the non- um, critical, non-premium positions in free agency because they're not going to cost you an arm and a leg, right? You know, you, it's impossible to find a great wide receiver or pass rusher in free agency because either they never become available or because Correct. they're too expensive. But positions like linebacker, safety, guard, center, those are the positions you can target in free agency because you're not going to break the bank, yeah. and you could still okay. get a guy that is a, like, like, for example, look what the Seahawks got on Julian Love last year. Right. Well, but, I mean, but, but look I, at the Giants with David Boss. Bobby O'Karake. Yeah, I mean, yeah, even you, Kevin Zeitler, but, who was, but who was a solid look, guy. And look at what he's doing in Baltimore right now. So If you look at yeah. the way Joe Shane's been drafting, he's retained most of his draft picks. In both years that he's made, uh, you know, made the picks. And I think 12 in last year's right. out of 14 plays were retained. So the way he's doing it through the draft, I think, is the right way. Well, but I mean, Scott, keep in mind, too, he hasn't exactly had a chance. None of his draft picks have become free agents yet. Well, Dra- draft well picks I, th- I think he's talking about the – but you're talking about the, the guys that are drafted and make the team, right? Is that what you're Correct. referring to, Scott? Correct. Well, but also keep in mind what he inherited. He inherited, okay, a roster with a lot of question marks. In all likelihood, you're going to keep – the guys you bring in That's because correct. there's not a lot to choose from. As the years go by, that philosophy could very well change. And one of the things, Scott, that I wanted to point out, your point is well taken about the Packers, but if you truly want to go to why they competed with San Francisco, it was the play right. of the offensive line and Aaron Jones running the football. And if you uh, go back. And it was, Jordan Love is a big part of no, that too. But, but Love, Love threw for less than 200 yards. It wasn't a pass-happy game. They were correct. moving the ball on the ground wow. in those early drives, well, the look three, like, look that you, got up in down the field. Yeah, look what Jordan Love did against Dallas the week before. No, 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 but what I'm saying, but he specifically said San Francisco. I got you. Okay, so I'm focusing on that right. playoff game. They were not airing it out over the Niners' defense. They were winning up front, and they were running the ball. That's true. That's why they competed with the Niners. Anyways, I'll, I'll let you guys go, but my, my whole point is I think the draft, to me, is the way to go to try to get the players. And as you said, John, there's a plethora of offensive linemen that will be available that the Giants can No, develop. Scott, look, so, look, and, and, and thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Yes, you can't bring in two guards by a free agency. That, that That's probably not going to be what you do. I think you sign one and you draft one. Maybe you draft two. Maybe you draft one early, you draft one late. Guy you develop later on, and then you still have, you know, McKeithen and Azudu in-house. You hope maybe one of those guys can emerge in their third year. Um, but, yeah, I think you address it that way, but... You can't address every position via the draft. You ain't got enough picks. <laughs> well, that's why you got to balance it between right. both. I yeah. mean, look, and we talked about this, Howard, yesterday, and then Leroy will get to you next. Stop me where I'm wrong, Lance. Needs for this team. The depth and wide receiver is good, but you still don't have that 1A guy that teams have the game plan against. Correct? Yeah, I think that's very fair. Tight end, you got a full room. Bellinger and Waller, you want to come back with those two guys as your tight ends, I think you're fine. Okay? Yeah. Offensive line, we talked about the issues at guard, okay? Those are two big needs, all right? Running back, you don't know what the need is going to be with Saquon Barkley. He could be here. He might not be here. If he's not here, you're going to have to add somebody at running back. It's not going to be just Eric Gray, here's the job. And that No, you should know that going into the draft, right. what that situation is But my is point is be. that it could, yeah. it could be a need. 
depending oh, on what happens with Saquon yeah. Barkley, right? So there's there's offense for you. Now go to defense. With Aziz Ojolari's injury history, Jihad Ward's a free agent. Don't you need an edge rusher at some point, whether in free agency or in the draft, to add to that room? Well, also, Ojolari's going into the final year of his contract, too. All, so that's all, more of a reason why. All those things together, 1,000%. Yeah. I'm with you. That's a need. If Adoree Jackson comes back, who's your starting quarterback exactly across from Deontay Banks? I mean, Nick McLeod did a nice job. I don't know if you want to go into camp with him as your starter. At least you want competition at that spot. So corner could very well be a need. I think you're set at inside linebacker. Who's your three-technique defensive tackle? You have a run stuffer in um, Nacho. Yep. Dexter's Dexter. You know, monster nose tackle. Ashawn Robinson's a free agent, but he's not a three-technique pass rusher either. So you need a three-technique pass rusher. That's another need. Then you go to safety. If Xavier McKinney's not back, who's your second starting safety? Dane Belton can slide in there, but I think that's his position where if Dane Belton wins the job, great, but I think you want some competition there, right? Well, I think there's room to maybe add a veteran free agent, I would think. I think you give Belton the job, you have him and Pinnock play, and then you bring in an established guy to support both of them. My point here is I I think that could be a solution. I stopped counting, but I think that's what, seven different spots where there's like legitimate big-time need? Well, guess what? You're not finding seven players that can fill those needs in the draft. You, you just not don't have enough high picks to do that. So it has to be a combination of free agency in the draft, and you prioritize which spots that you want to fill with what. And again, my strategy, Lance, and you didn't have a chance to comment on this, is in free agency, it's better to go after, or you almost have to go after, the non-premium spots because the, the really good players at the premium spots, A, usually never become available to begin with, or B, if they do, are astronomically expensive. So it makes more sense to go after those non-premium positions, safety, even running back to a certain extent, right? Yeah. Linebacker, the Giants don't have a specific need there. But guard, safety, you know, those are the spots where maybe in free agency you can attack those positions a little bit, not break the bank, bring in a few quality players for a little less money that can start for you and be starting caliber, while those premium spots, corner, wide receiver, um, offensive tackle, pass rusher, those are the guys you want to attack in the draft and try to get them on those rookie contracts where they become very, very valuable to you, like the Giants did with Kayvon Thibodeau, like they did with Andrew Thomas, like they're trying to do with Evan Neal. Deontay Banks. Deontay Banks, Banks as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's the logical move. The skill set positions where you want to get your playmakers, if you could find them in the draft and then you could develop them, you know, at least you'll have them on the books for a few years where they're not putting a great deal of stress on your salary cap. I'd also throw in interior defensive linemen. You could probably go through free agency, too, if you wanted. I don't think that's going to necessarily break the piggy bank, depending, depending on, of course, what that player does now, in the track record. For example, like Justin Matabikoe, who is a three-technique defensive tackle, I, that dude's going to make $20 million. In the well, he's season. also coming from a really good defense, Correct. too, which is going to help his cause. You know, maybe if you go after somebody from a defense right. that doesn't necessarily have the reputation as he does, you know, you don't necessarily have to spend as much. But interior offensive line, interior defensive line, safety, running back, you know, all of those to me are positions you could target in free agency Agreed. where you can then leave the draft capital going towards players who could very well be more impactful, but it just it makes more sense to balance your books that way. Because then, you know, remember, you're going to also have to start to make decisions on some of the players you mentioned, do you want to retain them? For example, McKinney, are you bringing him back? What's the market for him? You know, that's going to then eat into, John, the availability you have to Bingo. target some of the other free agents. So, you know, that's the other balancing mechanism that you got to take into consideration here. 201-939-4513. Let's go to Leroy in Charleston. What's going on, Leroy? Hey, how you guys doing? We're good. And Leroy, you owe me one. I I almost did my Leroy Jenkins chant, but I decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I got I got a couple of things I like to ask, man. You know, it's like as I was listening, you know, talking about Joe Shane, and I I'd like to see Shane get at least two more years beyond that. I mean, if you remember, Shane had to come in and get the get that cap in order. Leroy, you know, I would be shocked. Just, just, just real good. quick, I would be blown away, shocked if the Giants moved on from their general manager after just three years. That would be, oh, yeah, I would, yeah, I, that I, would be I shocking to me. I would, that would be shocking. Okay, yeah, I wanted to get that out of the way, man. Yeah. I, I, I would be disappointed if they did that too. Now, now the other thing is, 
Jerome Henderson. Where's he at? Isn't he the linebacker's coach? No, he's the secondary coach. Yeah, defensive back coach. Yeah. And, and he is still on the staff. He's still on the contract. And he interviewed for the, according to reports, he interviewed to the for the Giants defensive coordinator spot. Okay, that, that's what I was going to ask. I, I mean, I would love to see them just move him up. He knows the players. And I feel like, you know, a guy like that, he has probably some good ideas, things he would like to do with that defense already. I oh, love Rome. Why I, bring I, in? I, 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 I would be thrilled if Jerome Henderson got the job. I think he's a great coach. Okay, good man. Because I, I, everything I heard about him has been positive. Yeah, well, I, I mean, he's responsible for developing a lot of the young players at that position. I don't think anybody is thinking low of him. It's just a matter of, and I brought this up on previous shows, does Brian Dable want somebody with previous play-calling experience? He's never called plays, Leroy. That's the big difference. He's a really good positional coach. He has a wealth of experience. He even did a little scouting at some point in his career. He's just he's never called plays. Too, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, that's the question. You know, but I hear you, but, you know, just, just look at what Antonio Pierce said down. He was a linebacker coach or something. Yeah, but he and didn't call plays, though. Coach. No, no, but Leroy, I see, I disagree with you. There is a distinct difference between being the head man and delegating responsibilities and motivating players versus calling plays. Calling plays is an art. And case in point, the Eagles, okay, last year promoted Brian Johnson, their QB coach. So he was an internal guy, uh -huh. and he replaced Shane Steichen, who got the Colts job, and now they're moving on from Brian right. Johnson. So you got to sometimes... You have to think about that, and this is not a knock on Jerome Henderson. I'm with John. I think he's a valuable component on the staff, and you hope guys like that eventually get opportunities. I'm a big proponent of continuity, but I think sometimes you also need to say, just because you're maintaining continuity, can they now handle calling the plays, which once again is a different dynamic during the course of a game. And also leading a staff, right? You have to then delegate and lead a staff, yeah. which is something he hasn't done either. So that's something the Giants will have to decide, Leroy, whether or not he's capable of doing that. Well, he, I mean, he has to get an opportunity sometime, man. That's yeah. all. Yeah, no, sure. I don't we think agree. anybody's disputing that. Yeah, no, look, 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 really, we we agree with you. We're just, we're just giving the other side of the coin in terms of what the debate is as you decide whether or not to make certain hires. Okay, thank you, guys, man. No, great call, Leroy. Right. Yeah, appreciate the call. We do have an open line, folks. We have about seven minutes to go. If you want to give us a call, we can take him at two zero one nine three nine four five one three. And that is an interesting debate, right? And, you know, the other thing that's interesting, too, that I, I, I take a look at as we do all this, you know, we always praise coaches, and I'm one of the first people to do it, to go hire people outside of your tree, right? You know, you don't want to just hire your friends. You know, you want to get a oh, varied yeah. staff. But look, the wink situation here, go to Carolina, where that was a hodgepodge staff, where it wasn't, you know, Doug Peterson bringing in all of his guys, you know, they hired from all over the stuff. They, uh, they Wait, you talking about in... Jacksonville? I lost no, you. No, I'm, I'm Doug I'm, Peterson I'm in sorry, Carolina. Not, yeah. not the Frank we... Reich. Frank Reich Frank in Carolina. Reich. Okay, sorry. that's why. Wrong I former, lost you there. <laughs> wrong former Philadelphia Eagles uh, offensive coach. So Frank Reich, um, they, did, they did the all-star coaching thing down there in Carolina, right? It wasn't a bunch of Frank Reich guys. They hired, you know, McCown came from there. Um, the guy who was the ended up becoming the play caller came from a different spot. Uh, the defensive coordinator, I believe, was held over from the prior coaching staff, um, Evero, right? And well, no, Evero came from a different place. Well, that's what I'm saying. Evero, yeah. well, yeah. Evero came again. He wasn't related to Reich, right? No, okay. So, you're talking about previous experience yes. working with uh, Frank Reich, yeah? And that whole you. thing and all the sniping coming into that building. So I do think, and the point where I'm trying to get to through this long winding point is that there are benefits too from hiring guys in your circle that you know. And that they know you, you know them, you know how you work, you know what the workflow is going to be, trust. what the personalities are, you trust each other, guys are going to go in, they're going to do their thing, they understand the structure. While if, yeah, you bring in other guys, yeah, they come in with new ideas, I think that's a really good thing. You, They maybe make you uncomfortable, they you know challenge you on certain things, and that can make you a better head coach, right? But at the same time, there might not be that chemistry there and the trust to your point where everything ends up working out. So I think those are the interesting things that you're weighing here as you decide, do I bring in an outsider? Do I bring in somebody I know? Do I promote from within? These are all the types of things that you have to consider. Well, I think Dable has experience on both sides just from what he experienced here in New York, right? I mean, he inherited Thomas McGahee but then parted ways with him. And then the offensive line coach change and Bobby Johnson, he goes back with him to Buffalo. So... 
he really, he could say there's good, there's bad, there's indifference across the board in terms of everything that he's gone through. And he's also seen Belichick in New England promote from within. Belichick's a big guy in terms of just grooming, oh, Belichick learning never both sides of the ball, yeah, the and moving up the ladder. So I think Brian's got enough on his plate to say, I've seen it done in a variety of ways. Does the Wink experience move the needle more towards, okay, we went outside my box so now let's stay within the playhouse, perhaps. But I also don't. I would not think that that would scare him away to say no, I'm not going to now evaluate people who I have no connection to because I don't think you want to box yourself into the corner. Well, remember, he I never, think you want to leave your opportunities across the board. He never actually coached with Carmen Brasillo, who they brought in to be the offensive exactly. line coach. So yeah. now they have common roots, both coming from the Patriots, but they were never on a staff together. They never worked together. But he could speak to people who worked with him Correct. from New England, you know, even a Josh McDaniels, for example, who Dable knows. Oh, a million people yeah. that were on the staff in New England, he'd be able to talk, talk to. Yeah. He'll call Bill Belichick. Sure. And, and Bill yeah. Belichick will tell him what he's all about. So, yeah, I think that's an interesting part of this, that, you know, figuring out what the right balance is with those types of decisions. Yeah, and, you know, once again, it also depends on, I don't know, I don't think, has Jerome Henderson, I don't remember anybody asking him, and maybe you recall this, does he has aspirations to be a play caller? Not to say that he doesn't, but remember, Jerome no, Henderson's been in, in the NFL for quite some time. I have time. not heard that asked, but I got to, I mean, I think everyone does. No, right? I'm assuming, no, because remember, like, Wink said multiple times, I want to be a head coach again. Right. Right? Well, not again. He wants to be a head coach. Like, that was brought up in press conference after press conference. I don't remember that being brought up in conversation with Jerome Henderson, and that's not to say that he doesn't once again, want to be a play caller. But I guess what I'm saying is I haven't heard him publicly campaign for it, John, No, is what no, I'm no, getting no, no, at. No, no. Some guys, every time a microphone's in front of them, they're going to let you know, okay? <laughs> they want this position. They want this role. Yeah, Jerome's not that type of guy. He's not that type of guy. And does that mean that that's given people a reason to shy away from him? No. I mean, once again, he's a highly respected individual. He's been with a variety of different organizations. I think it just comes down to, once again, does Brian Dable want to stick with internal options and give them play calling opportunities, or does he now want to go outside of his acquaintances? I mean, for example, here's another player or individual that we were talking about, Mike Kafka, okay? He didn't have ties to Mike Kafka. He brought in Mike Kafka from Kansas City, and Kafka had not called plays, John, previously, and he gave him that opportunity. So, once again, you could point to many different individuals on staff and I think they fit into different boxes across the NFL where some have had experience, others haven't. So I don't really think there's anything that at least Brian Dable is saying to himself, I can't go down this road when he's been exposed yeah, to all it, of those pathways. In Atlanta, Lance, he was the passing game coordinator on defense, but he always had a defensive coordinator ahead of him yeah. calling the plays. So, yeah, it's interesting. I think it's a good question. Let's go to Doug and Glenn Falls. He'll wrap us up today. Hey, Dougie. Hi. I guess my main question, John, is, and I guess you were just talking about that with people internally. Isn't one of the key questions that Joe Shane and, and the ball are going to be asking all these um, D.C. candidates is um, what kind of scheme, and if they would try and take the players that are on the, on, on the roster already and try and, and maybe adjust their scheme to be able to utilize those players or, or – or, um, do something else. No, Doug, absolutely. I think a big part of all those interviews would be, all right, look, here are the guys that we consider the cornerstones of our defense. And the conversation starts with Dexter Lawrence, then you go to Bobby Okereke, then you go to Kayvon Thibodeau, then you go to Deontay Banks, and you say, all right, these are the guys that are going to be here. All right, these are the guys that we're building around. Coach, how do you want to use these players? And how do you want to utilize them? And then the Giants will say, all right, well, this coach kind of wants to use them in the same way Wink did. Maybe that's a good thing because they've had success. This guy really wants to change everything that, you know, they want. They don't want Dexter playing over the center. They want him playing more of a shade. Do we want that? They want to play more zone with Deontay Banks. Do we want to do that? Kayvon's got to be a down lineman in a 4-3. Do we want that? So, yeah, I think finding a coach that will utilize the personnel lands in the best possible way is a huge part of this interview process. No yeah. doubt about it. Well, that's why I said when Brian Dable has interviews, whether you hire the guy or not, you're getting input from external individuals, which to me is a good thing. But I will say this. There's no way 
that they're going to hire anybody that does not like Doug, the personnel grouping, okay? If you have an interview and the defensive coordinator candidate starts telling you, well, you know, I don't know if we could use him, then he's probably not the right guy to fit. So you want to hear good things. You want to hear that they're enamored with the personnel and they're going to do something positive with them. Now, but- of the staples, now, if there are some, like, fringe guys that the guy maybe doesn't like that's fine but or guys that are free agents and maybe the Giants front office is not going to bring him back anyway yeah they're not going to hire somebody that says yeah I really don't want to have you know Bobby Okereke Kayvon Thibodeau on my team that that is just not going to work for my defense and that guy's not getting the job yeah okay that makes sense? You answered my question. Yeah, have a good day. Thank All right, Doug. You. you too, Doug. Yeah. Appreciate the you call. Know, the other individual, by the way, if we're talking about internal candidates, Andre Patterson has been a defensive coordinator yes. before with the Vikings. But he was so, a co-defensive he coordinator? He was. He was a correct? co-defensive yes. coordinator with Mike Zimmer's son. So they could also entertain him as an option. He's done a really nice job developing some of these young defensive linemen. They can go like, and has a great track record with Minnesota. They can go run game coordinator and pass game coordinator too. And then maybe if Patterson would, would since he has experience, they would call the plays. They could work this a number of different ways. You're right. Yeah, I mean, it depends on is it the title or is it who has the role? You know, that's the, the bigger debate. You know, some individuals and you get into pay and this and that. Do they want the title or right. do they want the job on game day calling the plays? That's to each their own. But those are the two. Jerome Henderson, Andre Patterson, I think are the most appealing individuals in-house that have a wealth of experience. And in Patterson's case, he at least has been a defensive coordinator and has been able to orchestrate traffic on game day in terms of calling the plays. So, you know, that may also give Brian Dable some food for thought. Right, it's good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. For Lance Meadow, I'm John Schmoke. That's Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Football Giants. Thank you so much for being with us. Don't forget, the Giants official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV, brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. For Lance Meadow, I'm John Schmelk. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm off to Frisco, then Mobile. Uh, I will not be hosting the show until the week after the Senior Bowl, so that's about a good, you know, uh, 10, 12 days away. I look forward to being back, but don't worry. I'm bringing a little Comrex box, so I'll be joining, hopefully, with clear audio uh, throughout the week next week, uh, giving you all the latest of what's happening from Mobile at the Senior Bowl. We'll see you then, everybody. Adios.